Merry Christmas. Uh, come to a lull in the festivities. And so I'm going to do the program. May not have time to do anything later. It's going to get real busy real quick, probably. There may be several days this week like that. <laughs> but I'm glad that you're here for the program and that uh, you can watch it when you get time to watch it. Or you can skip it. I'm just going to keep going. I love all of you and I wish you a Merry Christmas. Knowing that Jesus died for you. He shed his blood for you. And God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to hang on an old rugged cross to buy our way out of hell. I think that's pretty cool. It is the prime motive of my life for these many years. That's what got me going. It's what keeps me going. That faith. That he enabled me to have. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. Who hath enabled me. And that he counted me faithful. Putting me into the ministry. Who before was a blasphemer. And a persecutor. And injurious. But I obtain mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And add to that, and I thank our, let's see, no, I just did that one. The other one that I like so much is God forbid that I should glory, saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom the world is crucified to me and I into the world God bless you all Merry Christmas welcome uh, we're in Jeremiah chapter 15 the book of the prophet Jeremiah and uh, I'll just back up a little bit uh, God is explaining to Jeremiah that he will save a remnant and that the, the destruction is going to be huge but he is willing to save a remnant he will save a remnant both in the land and he will save a remnant in the captivity to return them from the captivity out of that bunch of people. He will save a remnant. God always saves a remnant. There is never a time that I can find in the Bible where he hasn't provided for a remnant. If only to leave someone to tell the story of his great goodness and his mercy and his kindness and his long suffering and his, his majesty. Beginning in verse 10, we'll back up a little bit. Woe is me, my mother. Jeremiah is crying to the Lord that thou hast borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent on usury, nor men have lent to me on usury, yet every one of them doth curse me. God explains about the remnant now. Verse 11, the Lord said, Verily it shall be well with thy remnant. Verily I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil and in the time of affliction. Shall iron break the northern iron in the steel? Thy substance and thy treasures will I give to the spoil without price, and that for all thy sin, even in all thy borders. And I will make thee to pass with thine enemies into a land which thou knowest not. For a fire is kindled in my anger, which shall burn upon you. So I'm going to save some of you. Any who will return to me, you return to me, I'll save you. I'll protect you. I'll deliver you. But I'm still going to destroy the country. That's where we're at in the United States. He will save a remnant. He will destroy the country. He's already made up his mind. We are in the punitive judgments right now. The remedial judgments or the warnings began on November 22nd, 1963. 
The punitive judgments began on September 11, 2001, and they continue to this day, and they get worse every day. And he will consume until there's nothing left, but he's willing to save anybody who will come to him. Anybody. Now, Jeremiah is going to talk and plead with the Lord again. O oh Lord, verse 15. Thou knowest. You know everything. Well, John tells the angel in Revelation chapter 7, and uh, the angel uh, says to John, he sees, he sees this great multitude sitting under the throne of God in white robes. And the angel said, asked to John, he says, who are these? And John says, thou knowest. <laughs> you know, I don't. I'm just a visitor here. You're showing me a vision. I don't know what it means. I don't know who they are. And then he tells them, those are they that have uh, been martyred for the name of Jesus Christ and have washed their garments white in the blood of the Lamb. And they were without number, a great multitude. Another time, thou knowest, Peter, on the beach there on the Sea of Galilee after the resurrection of Jesus, and he swims to, uh, to meet Jesus on the shore. They have their meal together. Come and dine, the master calleth. Come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry calleth he, come and dine. Um, he said, do you love me, Peter? And he goes, yeah, I love you. Do you love me? Yeah, I love you. Do you love me? Look, <laughs> thou knowest all things. He said, Jesus, he tells Jesus, you know everything. You know how I love you. You know how much I love you. You know how much I'm able to love you. You know I don't. That's reminiscent as Jeremiah begins his plea where he says, O oh Lord, thou knowest. You can begin your prayer to God with, you know, Lord, thou knowest. You can start it off the way because he knows you. He knows everything that's happening around you. He knows everything that's happening to you. Good morning, Kevin. Merry Christmas. He knows everything that you're going through. So it's perfectly wonderful to start off a prayer with, O oh Lord, thou knowest. O oh Lord, you know. You know what's going on. I don't think I want to go through it, Lord. You already know what's going on. If I start talking about it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start bawling. You know my heart. You know how messed up things are. I want you to fix it. O oh Lord, thou knowest. Remember me. Remember me. What's what the thief on the cross said? Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Don't remember my sin. Don't remember how vile I am upon this cross. Don't remember that I'm guilty of my crimes. Don't remember that I've stolen, that I've lied, that I've shed innocent blood, that I've blasphemed. Don't remember any of that. Remember me. Remember me who you made. Remember me who you're giving your life now to save here on this cross. Because I know that you're going to die just like we're going to die. But I also know that you're the son of God and you will rise from the dead. And he proves it by saying, this man, Jesus, is in the same case I am. He's just as messed up as I am. He's going to bleed to death here on the cross just like I will if they don't break my legs first, which they do, causing him to suffocate. But they break not Jesus' legs because he was already dead. Jesus didn't die in the same sense that the... The, the thief on the cross died. Jesus surrendered his life. He laid down his life. He gave up to go. He said, I have the power to lay down my life. I have the power to take it up again. This commandment have I received from my father. No man took Jesus' life from him. The Romans didn't take it. The Jews didn't take it. The people in the crowd didn't take it. He gave it. 
For unto us a child is born, that's what happened at Christmas. Unto us a son is given, that's what happens on Calvary. Praise God. Yeah. There's a lot of difference between unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The thief knew that Jesus was going to die. But he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Lord, remember me. But the publican beating on his breast in the temple, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is during the flood. The whole earth is flooded. The waters start to go down. And the flood was upon the earth for over a year. Oh, it, it, it only rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but the flood waters were upon the earth for a year. Then there's this wonderful verse, and it said, And God remembered Noah. Put your name in there. God remembered Kevin. God remembered Jimmy. The thief said, Lord, remember me. Jeremiah says, O Lord, thou knowest, in verse 15, remember me. Remember me. Remember what you told me to do. Remember what I've been doing these last 10 years plus. Remember what the people have done to me. Remember what they're trying to do me now. Do to me now. Uh, visit me. Pay me a visit. Give me some comfort. He wants even more than that. Visit me. Come physically visit me, Lord, and revenge me of my persecutors. All these people who are trying to destroy me, Lord, I want you to take care of them. I want you to wipe it out. Wipe it. Wipe them out. Just take care of them. Obliterate them. Make them quit punishing me. Make them quit persecuting me. Make them quit chasing me. Make them quit trying to arrest and kill me. Because I'm doing your job here, Lord. Remember me. Remember what I'm doing. I'm telling them everything you tell me to tell them. And they've taken my house. They've taken my land. They've taken my father's land. They've taken away his name. They've taken away his heritage. They took my bride. They took the girl I was going to marry. They took my sweetheart. They took everything I had. I want you to deal with them. Now they seek to take my life, too. Deal with them, Lord. Remember me, visit me, and revenge me. Avenge the things that have, uh, seek, get revenge for me. Avenge the things that have been done to me. Oh, Lord, remember me. You ever feel like praying that prayer? Have you ever had to pray that prayer? If you had that prayer, had to pray that prayer, say, Lord, avenge me, remember me. Uh, take the battle to my persecutors. Take the battle to my enemies. Destroy my enemies. Keep them away from me. If you've never had to pray that prayer, you have not served the Lord our God. Unless you, unless people want to kill you, you're probably doing it wrong. We serve a mighty God. We must go forth boldly and proclaim his message. Now, you're not going to get persecuted for siding with the majority. You won't get persecuted if all you do is associate with people who think exactly the same way you do and live in a bubble. You're not going to get persecuted if you never leave your house or open your mouth. But if you speak up boldly for the Lord Jesus Christ and pray that miracles and signs and wonders be done by the name of his holy child, Jesus, 
and the Holy Ghost is going to fill you. The Holy Ghost is going to fill all those around you who follow you and who keep you and who bless you with their attendance and with their support. God never chose you to hide. You've been drafted into an army. Act like it. Quit being a wall from your post. Confront the enemies of God. Stand fast. Be bold. O oh Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me. Revenge me of my persecutors. <sighs> Take me not away in thy long suffering. So Lord, I know you're patient, and I know that you don't want to hurt these people. I know that you don't want to hurt anybody unnecessarily. You have, and you have no joy in the death of the wicked. I know that. And you, you don't want to, uh, uh, you, you want to hold back your hand as long as you can, hoping that some will come to repentance because you know, some will, because you've offered a way out. You've offered a way out right here in the midst of this catastrophe, in the midst of this crisis where the famine is killing us. The pestilence is coming. The drought, the famine, the pestilence, the death, and the sword, and the captivity. It's all coming on us. But you're willing to save anybody who will return to you and deliver them. Like you're doing it for me. So you're long-suffering, Lord. You're having mercy, but <laughs> don't hold out so long that these people stop me. You told me not to pray for them. I keep praying for them, you, but now I'm praying for you to get them off my back. You need, I'm sure you've had to pray that prayer before if you're in the ministry, of course. And nearly everybody who serves God in any capacity at some time will have to pay that prayer. Know that for thy sake I have suffered abuse. Do you, <laughs> you know, you don't have to remind Jesus that you're suffering for him, but we do. Lord, look what they're doing to me. Uh, they're disrupting my income. They're taking away my opportunities to work. They're barring me from platforms. They're refusing to publish my books. They, they, uh, they're not inviting me to speak at, at big meetings anymore, or very rarely because I'm so controversial, right? You know, somewhere along the way, it became controversial to speak the truth about the God who lives forever, revealed in the Bible as his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, his only son, his only begotten son. And there is uh, none other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Remember, Lord, I'm suffering because of you. Now, I know I suffer because of my own sin. I know that I lied here and that I fornicated there and, and that I stole here in my background a long time ago before I was saved. And to tell you the truth, I committed plenty of sins after I got saved because I was a rebellious servant. One of my greatest sins was not obeying the Lord God and the things that he told me to do. Being stubborn. Rebellion is the same as witchcraft. When you rebel against the Lord, you may as well be sacrificing a goat or, or, or you know, swinging a dead chicken around your head and, and uh, worshiping the, the demons and the devils with that uh, palamum gallo or santeria or whatever it is. Hoodoo. The hoodoo stuff. Voodoo, hoodoo, who dat? It's all just a bunch of devil worship. It's corrupt. It's straight out of hell. But when you rebel against God in any matter at all, you're the same as a devil worshiper. How do I know that? Because Samuel said, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. That is the word of God. Bank on it, baby. 
It's as true as night's dark and day's light. Live by it. Do not rebel. Rebellion is the worst thing you can do. Because when you're in a rebellious state, you're only one step away. You're already in error, and you're only one step away from heresy. And that means you're only two steps away from apostasy. Don't give in to it. Quit worshiping the devil. Quit being a rebel. Jeremiah says in verse 16, he says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. You told me your words. I wrote them down. I ate them down. And we spilled them up on the page. I wrote some of them down, but mostly it's Baruch, my servant, that's writing them down. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Boy, when I became a preacher, I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. I said, I'm going to be a man of God, and everybody's going to be proud of me for doing it. And I, I started interacting with some people who were glad that I quit drinking, but were mortified that I became a preacher. You know, I tell, I've told you the line before, I lost half my friends when I quit drinking. I lost the other half when I started preaching. And that's all true. And I had to find some new friends. God gave me new friends. But I thought that people would be excited because I was serving the Lord. I was full of joy and rejoicing I was, because I was called by the name of God, the God of hosts, to do his work. And I would tell people, yeah, I'm not like I used to be. I said, uh, I, said I, I believe what the Bible says. And I said, well, why would you believe the Bible? It's just a, a myth. Well, see, I believe in Jesus. Why would you believe in Jesus? He probably never existed. And if he did, he's just a man. And uh, he might have been a good teacher, but all, the, the, all the, the major scholars agree that he never said any of that stuff he said in the Bible. This is what the Jesus seminars. So he said, I ran against into all of that. I ran up against all of that when I got saved. People were glad that I weren't drinking, but they would rather have me drunk and rather have me calling them for a handout than to be a man of God boldly proclaiming the word of God and not caring how the chips fall, not caring what it did to me. I had to come clean about things. I had to talk about my sins. I had to make up for them. And by make up, I mean, I mean, I had to make it right with the people I sinned against as much as I was able. You know, some people didn't want to have anything to do with me and who can blame them. But see, I had that idea in my head. I was full of joy. I was full of rejoicing because God had called me and, and I'm calling him by his name. And he chose me for this work. He put his words in my mouth, just like he did to Jeremiah. You know, and 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 the, the the liberating feeling of knowing that I don't answer to anybody on Christ and answer to no man on earth. I only answer to Him. Now, if I commit a crime, the state of Missouri will probably say I have to answer to them, just like when I got a speeding ticket back in June. But my relationship with the Lord didn't cut any ice with the count with the with the uh, with the city uh, the city clerk there uh, for the for the traffic judge. Now, he didn't care. He didn't care whether I was a preacher or not. I broke the law. I had to pay. You break the law, you have to pay. I'm talking about I don't have to answer for anything in the spiritual realm to anybody except Christ. And this all has real physical implications. When you preach against abandoning God to go whoring after other gods, people are going to be mad at you. When you preach against sacrificing your children either to the abortuaries or to the society or to the government or to the culture uh, or to their own whims, whatever they are, and their own confusion and madness and sexuality and perversion, you sacrifice them to all that, they're going to hate you. 
And if you refuse to believe the lying prophets and the lying priest, and you can expand that to the lying politicians, the lying ruling class, the lying reigning class, the lying corporate class, you, you, you stretch it all the way to that and people will be mad at you all the time and they will hate you and you will have to go to God and say, please, God, stop my enemies. Get them off my back. Give me time enough to either escape or to dig in and fight. Give me strength. Give me boldness. I never knew that I would have to suffer such rebuke at the hands of idiots. Oh, well, the Bible was just written by a bunch of ignorant shepherds and fishermen. It's all a myth. None of it's real. And then worse, you got people, people in the church that say that, well, this part's real and this part isn't. Who are you going to believe? See, it's an all or nothing proposition. If God is God, he's preserved his word and he saved it for you. Uh, if the Bible isn't true, then none of it's true. If God didn't speak, then none of it's true. Because he said he spoke, we call God a liar. So you can see the dilemma. I ate the word of God and it gave me joy and I rejoiced that I was called. And I, I, I changed. I, verse 17, I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I didn't, I didn't sit with the sinners. I didn't associate with them. I didn't rejoice in their works. I condemned them. I sat alone because of thy hand. You put your hand on me and separated me from the world, Jeremiah says. Jimmy Harris says, you have put your hand on me and separated me from everybody else. And it's a hard and lonely place to be sometimes. And God, don't you remember when you did that? Remember me. How did the prayer start out? Oh, Lord, remember me. I sat not in the assembly of the mockers. I nor rejoiced. I sat alone because of thy hand. For thou hast filled me with indignation. I hate their works. I hate the shedding of innocent blood. I hate their violence. I hate the fact that they hate you. I hate all the liars, the lying prophets, the lying politicians, the lying know-it-alls, the lying, I hate them all. And I hate the lies. I hate what they're doing to the country, just like Jeremiah hated what they were doing to his country. Why is my pain perpetual? Jeremiah said, why does this bug me so much? Why is my wound incurable? Which refuseth to be healed. You're the great healer, Lord. Why don't you heal me? Oh, excuse me. I had bologna and eggs for breakfast. You can do that when you get up before everybody else and cook what you want. Ha! <laughs> I got them, didn't I? Will thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as waters that fail? God, you said you'd sustain me. Well, I'm, I'm not particularly sure that you're doing it right now. Could you explain yourself to me? Well, God will explain himself, but he doesn't usually. If you never said, God, why am I suffering this? God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you letting this happen? If you never prayed that prayer, then you haven't suffered for it. Because when you're suffering for Christ, you think all kinds of weird things. You think, well, maybe I, maybe I flipped when I should have flopped. Maybe I clicked, should have clicked. Maybe I clicked when I should have clacked. <laughs> maybe I went up when I should have went down. You, you start second guessing everything because you feel alone and the world is beating the side of your head and kicking you in the teeth and knocking you down because it hates God. Did you lie to me, Lord? You told me that you'd protect me. Well, you didn't do much to protect my reputation. I used to 
I used to ruin my own reputation, but now my reputation is bad because I'm speaking the truth that you gave me to teach. The world hates me. Jeremiah, in a sense, is saying, it's all your fault, Lord, that I'm in this mess. But he had the right position originally. He said, he said, when I found your words, Lord, when I found your words, I ate them up and they gave me joy. And my heart rejoiced. For I am called by thy name. O oh, Lord God of hosts. Now, for every time that I've doubted God, for every time that I've begged God, for every time I've been confused and confounded and ashamed, I tell you, and I will give you this as my promise, because I have this promise from God. If you are obeying the Lord, if you are trusting in Jesus Christ and Christ alone and your mind is set on him, then whatever is going on, he will sustain you. He will hold you up. He will make you stand. I'm not guaranteeing the outcome. The outcome could be awful for you or for people around you. That happens all the time. I don't imagine Paul wanted Nero to cut his head off. I don't imagine Peter wanted to get crucified upside down, as tradition tells us. I don't believe James was wanted to be thrown from the pinnacle of the temple, as tradition tells us. I don't believe they wanted any of these things. But God enabled them to take it. And they stood fast in the commission that God gave them until the very last. They held until relieved. Every one of them. And that's what it's up to us to do. Remember the joy. Remember the rejoicing. Remember the word of God. And remember the commission that is given to us. Not only as ministers. Not only as what you would call clergy. But as Christians. As servants of the living Christ. We are all officers. We are all ambassadors of that kingdom that we pray to come. Remember the joy. Remember the honor. Remember your duty. But most of all, Remember his glory. And when you say, oh Lord, remember me. Never forget. He does.